This conference okay. will now be recorded. Okay, so uh, Colin, uh, thank you for letting me present uh, on the merits of uh, absolute base tamping versus, versus relative base tamping. Um, at the end of the pres presentation, I've just got a couple of slides um, on our uh, Kirov crane capabilities and uh, also hot off the press, we've just finished a um, animation of the cranes, so uh, you're going to be the first people to, to see it. Right, so first of all, uh, SB Rail were formed in 2004, uh, making the joint venture one of the longest partnerships in the business. Uh, we are uh, renowned for innovation and first of class machines, um, including uh, the uh, Placer and Thora 09404 4S dyna dynamic tampers, the uh, AFM uh, 2000 uh, ballast regulators. Uh, we also uh, introduced the Sprinter concept of tamping to the UK. Um, the, if, if, if you're not quite sure what the Sprinter concept is, it's, uh, this is for shortwave tamping. Uh, so uh, traditionally tampers uh, design one rail um, and lift the other rail uh, to the predetermined pre, uh, cant. Uh, sprinting tamping uh, designs each rail individually. Uh, this is ideal for voiding sites. You can't sprinter over more than 20 meters, uh, but interestingly as well, you can, if, you, if you've got it in sprinter mode, uh, tamp in, in the middle of a transition and in, in normal um, tamping mode, that's a massive no-no. Another first uh, is our Kirov rail cranes. Um, as everyone knows, traditionally, all cranes work with rope. Um, we've uh, turned that idea on its head. Um, what we've done is we've put a, a robot arm on the end of uh, the, the booms, uh, the boom, which uh, means that, that we can um, control the load. Right, so what tampers uh, do we have in our fleet? Uh, we have plane line machines, uh, including two 093X machines, we have a 32 tool 08 machine uh, for general purpose SNC or plain line. Uh, we've got four 08 compact machines and five 08 Unimax machines. And since 2014, we have been in introducing the um, 09 4x4 4S technology to the UK. By Easter next year, um, we'll, we will have six of these machines in the UK, uh, making SB Rail the largest operator of this type of machine in the country. Um, our fleet then uh, will also be the youngest in the UK. We uh, uh, also own and operate two AFM 2000 ballast regulators. Uh, these come with uh, DGS capabilities and uh, ballast scanning capabilities. Uh, we also own and operate uh, a USP ballast regulator. And uh, as I said before, we've also got four Kirov multitask um, 250 rail cranes. Uh, we also bring in continental gauge machines from Europe uh, through the channel tunnel to operate on high speed one infrastructure. Uh, the machines in question are a 0932 4S which is the big brother of the 09 4x4 4S. And we also uh, bring in a BDS uh, ballast regulator, which in turn is a big brother of the AFM. Um, the machines are working on, on high-speed one right now, and uh, they've been over now for four weeks. Uh, they be, they, the last shift is on Thursday night. So um, our machines work from high-speed one to the highlands of Scotland. Uh, which is a huge geographical area to cover. So what is this present presentation about? Uh, it's about the differences between absolute base tamping, uh, which is more commonly known as design tamping, and uh, relative base tamping, which is more commonly called smooth tamping. So interestingly, in re renewals, uh, approximately 95% of all our works is to absolute base tamping, but in uh, maintenance, it's around the other way. Uh, approximately 90% of all our works are relative base tamping. 
to the quick silver water. So uh, in order to deliver the most sustainable tamping results for track geometry performance and to increase the mean time between repairs, any tamping that is carried out to improve ride comfort, uh, which includes the, the removal of long wave defects and re-established track position is completed by using track designs formed by the use of data collected from modern survey te techniques. Absolute base tamping uh, uses fixed refer reference points to determine the amount of track realignment is necessary to return the track to its design absolute track geometry position. There's uh, lots of um, equipment that you can use. Some of the systems is uh, the Guido system, the Amberg trolley. Um, you could, in theory, ask Network Rail to borrow one of their um, MSATs if they're still working. Um, a lot of the newer 09 machines now come with uh, curved laser. Um, and what you can do as well is use a, a, a total station with rail shoes or rail bars. There's lots of other um, systems out there that you could use. So best practice is to have a through alignment design or tab for areas where design tamping is completed. The track survey will reference to the fixed points or control points and the geometry will be known in between these points. Using software supplied by the various survey ma manufacturers, a schedule of slews and lifts uh, along with the track geometry is produced. Limits can be set within the software uh, if slew and lift restrictions have been set, but rates of change in both slews and lifts should be counted for. Um, I know on uh, high speed one, uh, the allowable rate, rate of change is uh, 0.25 uh, millimeters per meter. Uh, track designs can also be produced using an arbitrary survey grid uh, by just surveying the track, uh, but uh, obviously this will not tie into a TAD. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of, of uh, design tamping? So some of the, the advantages are uh, a reduction in tamping cycles and whole life costs. Um, there'd be no issues with clearances to structures, or if you're working in an area of um, uh, over a wire, there'd be no uh, clearance issues there. There'd be an increase in life for track infrastructure. There, there will definitely be an improvement in long wave track quality and ride comfort. Uh, the route maintainers will know where their track is. Um, machine utilization uh, increases within possessions. So what do I mean by that? So uh, in theory, there'd be no pre-recording runs. The machine can just enter the possession, get to the start point and uh, immediately start tamping. Uh, this is uh, what we do on high speed one. So uh, what are the disadvantages? So uh, there, there will definitely be a higher initial cost of installation. Uh, if we talk about high speed one, uh, they've got uh, 130 kilometers of track uh, surveys with survey spigots spaced every 50 meters uh, on the OCS mass. Um, I was part of the team who um, installed the TAD. So uh, the way that we did it, we had uh, primary uh, control every 10 kilometers. We had uh, secondary control every 200 to 300 meters. Um, and then we have the tertiary on the mass every 50 meters. So relative based uh, tamping. So what is relative based tamping? So relative based tamping is defined as tamping using the tamping machine's own reference system to smooth the existing track geometry to eliminate track geometry defects. Um, in effect, this means a residual defect is left and will soon propagate uh, and passenger discomforts um, and long wave defects will again be seen. Using smooth or relative based, based tamping without any consideration to track design or position will not effectively remove long wave track defects uh, as the algorithms used to calculate correction values will only remove a percentage of the defect 
thus only smoothing uh, any defects. From a financial perspective, this escalates OTM maintenance costs due to the need to react more frequently to track geometry conditions. So faults are never fully repaired when relative base tamping. Why is this? Uh, so if we use the diagram as an example, uh, you will see that the vertical distance between line AB and CB reduces uh, as you get nearer to B. Uh, in other words, the drop of 30 mil at A is reduced to a drop of 10 mil at D, which is a ratio of three to one. Uh, smoothing tamping uses this concept uh, and any drop or rise in the rail on which the front arrow is standing is reduced at the point of tamping. Uh, the alignment uses the same concept, uh, just on a different plane. So by reducing all the areas in level to a fraction of the value, we can be certain that we have made an improvement in, in the level uh, of the track. The uh, uh, actual amount of error reduction will vary on different machine types according to the ratio of AB uh, to DB. Um, increasing the length of AD in theory would improve the smoothing effect, uh, but will also cause uh, a greater adverse effect in lift on vertical curves and uh, transitions. So the ratio is therefore a compromise uh, to give the best smoothing uh, with the smallest side effects under all conditions. So here we are, we've got a picture of a, um, an 094 by 4 here. Um, and here I'm just showing you uh, points A, D and B. Uh, so on this particular machine, uh, A, B uh, is 16.7 metres um, and A, D is 11.1 uh, metres. As you can see there, the DTS unit's missing. <laughs> So what are the advantages and disadvantages of using the relative base method? So um, advantages, there'd be no uh, pre-surveys, so no extra possessions. There'd be no processing of the survey data in the office, uh, which obviously saves time. And being slightly controversial, uh, the customer um, does not require uh, high skill levels with their staff. So disadvantages, um, as I explained earlier, faults are, are never fully repaired. Uh, transition intersections have moved. Uh, over time, tops and bottoms of uh, transi transitions start to be pushed and pulled in all directions. Uh, if you look at some transitions in, in geometry viewing software, uh, they look like a elongated S, which is never good. Um, both the vertical and horizontal radii uh, can be changed from the original design. Uh, the cant can be changed from design, which is never good. Uh, you could definitely have issues with clearances. Uh, there's rail stress implications. Um, I'll try and explain that more. So uh, if we were to uh, increase the horizontal geometry year on year, uh, then, then we are going to be adding stress to the rail. Um, and if we decrease the radius uh, year on year, then we're going to be removing stress from the rail. Screen. So the next uh, few slides uh, are just screenshots from uh, the front tower. This is what the operator can see. So um, on this one, this is the initial uh, relative measurement run, uh, which references the current track condition. So starting from the left, uh, we've got the lining window. Uh, as you can see there, this is showing a reverse curve, right hand to left hand. The center window uh, is the camp window. Uh, this all, always, um, this nearly always looks like the same as the lining window. 
Uh, the only exception would be if you had a, a non-canted curve. And the right window is the level window. Uh, the pink window is the measured longitudinal measurement. Next slide. So uh, this is the working mode screen start of relative tamping. Uh, from the left, we have the lining window, uh, then the front offset window. You'll see there that there's um, a, a red dotted line either side of the uh, yellow line. Uh, this is the limit that has been set by the operator. Uh, so the next one is the count window, followed by the le level window, followed by the level correction window. Again, you can see there that the operators um, uh, put in the lift limit line or the, or the gate. Right, uh, next one. Right. Uh, this screen shows what information is required when we. No, it's not. So this uh, screen here, this is uh, merge files from two separate recording runs. Uh, the red line uh, on uh, shows the pre-run. The green line, if you can see it, shows the calculated position, and the blue line shows the post-measurement actual track position. Right, so this screen shows what information is required uh, when we complete a design tamp. Uh, from the left, the first screen is horizontal geometry, uh, followed by the camp window, then the vertical geometry. The two screens uh, on the right um, are the offsets uh, and level corrections, uh, which will be applied to the geometry. Uh, for your information, the uh, blue horizontal line is the front encoder wheel. So um, the three screens on the left, that's the geometry file, and the two screens on the right, uh, that's the virtual file. So when you um, uh, press go on the tamper, those two files will merge. Uh, and you can start tamping. What we always do prior to actual actually tamping, we put it into a, a check mode uh, so, so we can run through the design um, prior to tamping. So why do we do this? Uh, for, for example, if we were to have a, a gradient change uh, on a constant gradient, it's imperative uh, that the plus or minus gradient uh, is in the uh, correct plane. Um, if you get it wrong, uh, you're going to end up in a world of pain, which you don't want at half past three in the morning. So what do SBRL recommend? Um, we feel that all mainline tracks uh, should have a TAD installed. We feel that training and mentoring of uh, all uh, frontline technical staff needs to improve. Um, we also think that after renewals, Network Rail should uh, mandate that it's it's only um, design tamping uh, in those areas again. And the last two bullet points um, refer to how our European neighbours always design tamp main lines uh, and always have uh, two machines working in tandem on mainline tracks. Um, that being a, a tampering regulator. The system that's working on, on high speed one uh, at the moment, it's, uh, it's called an MDZ. Uh, I'm not too sure what that means in German, but that's what it's, uh, it's called. So in summary, uh, relative base or smooth tamping um, is only to be carried out for short vertical and uh, horizontal wave defects. Relative based tamping smooths and reduces the horizontal and vertical defects. Smooth tamping must become the exception 
uh, or when you're sprinter tamping. And absolute base or design tamping. Um, absolute base or design tamping is recommended if there are long wave defects. Uh, design tamping to become the norm um, so the track can be put back to its original position. Right now I'm just moving on to the uh, the, the crane slides. So um, SB Rail, uh, we operate four of these uh, KRC 250 cranes across the UK. Um, as you can see from the photo, uh, you can't see any rope there. Uh, at the end of the boom, uh, there's the articulated robot arm, um, and we've got lots of uh, attachments that will fit into the uh, the white chassis that you can see at the bottom of the yellow boom. Right, okay. What I need to do now is just start the video. So I'm just going to play that. Right, okay. Oh. Right, so um, so tell us about crane. Uh, Rail has developed the KLC 250 model task uh, into a, a truly multi discipline machine. As you can see, the ability to sleep and laying because we've got the robot arm. So the robot arm is unique to SB Rail. Uh, it's an ingenious device attached to the end of the crane's boom. It operates through hydra hydraulically controlled pivots. Uh, providing complete control of uh, uh, tilt rotation. Inclination long to interestingly, if you, you were to put a um, signal and for a lot long beam on that, you could be a, a, a windmill. So this system is the KLC system. So this combines two of our cranes, 500 or tandem tech into wind, uh, with one and a half tons, working ALO.
Вот. Да. Right, that is it from me. That's uh, went through that a bit quick, but um, hopefully it was uh, informative. Thank you for that, Matt. Yeah, I certainly learned uh, quite a bit there. Um, uh, for everyone else uh, on the right hand side up in the chat box, if you uh, have any questions, if you just enter in there, then I'll ask them uh, directly to Matt. Uh, just while we're up to Matt, there was a few little uh, um, connection issues on the video, not so much visually, but we struggled to hear uh, the commentary oh, on it as well. Uh, but no problem, I think the, the functionality comes through loud and clear, excuse the pun. Um, but with the cranes, um, I think I'm right in saying the reach was um, 10 metres. What's the um, lifting capacity? It's uh, 25 ton. Uh, there's the uh, the Kirov cranes come in. Uh, there's the uh, in the UK. There's the KLC 250, uh, which can lift uh, 25 ton. Uh, ton. There's the Kirov 810, uh, which can lift uh, approximately 70 75 ton. And there's the Kirov uh, 1200, which can lift 100 ton. Wow! So it's, it's horses for courses uh, on, yeah. on the jobs, really. Excellent. Very good. Uh, is there any questions from anyone else out there? Yeah, Colin, I, I've got a question actually. Um, is Phil Edwards? Um, have Have you actually used um, the Kirov cranes to do any high speed switch replacements? Uh, you know, We've, some of the high speed switches are very very long. Uh, yeah, you probably uh, need two two Kirovs in some instances. Uh, yes, yeah, it would. Um, we've got the machines approved to work on on high speed one. Uh, that was done about a, about a year ago, uh, and, and we have looked at different working methods of uh, of swapping out the SNC. Um, uh, luckily uh, for high speed one, they haven't had to change any for a while. So uh, yeah, but the it, it, it has been looked into. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? I think your presentation must have been uh, uh, very uh, educational. Um, Colin, the question here. Colin, do you want me to run the um, the video with the sound on? So uh, maybe it, it'll come through then. We can try that. Yeah, let's try that. Okay. It's developed the key multi disrupt chaos discipline. Machine with a series of innovative attachments. I think we have a similar problem, Matt, with the uh, commentary uh, playing for your laptop. Uh, we're not getting much of the dialogue, unfortunately. Currently, SB Rail operates four of these rail cranes across the United Kingdom. An ingenious tool, quickly controlled, pivot, 